got her on the phone and I read her the letter the best I can. Uh, and she goes, wow, she says, that sure sounds like our Mr. Gridley, but I never knew we had, he had relatives up in Wisconsin. And I said, well, I says, you know, they got these letters and I says, it's, it's addressed to, to uh, Miss Storch here in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Wow, she says, and then she stopped and it, there was just this hesitation in her voice. And she says, do you realize what today is? And I'm going, no, I don't have a clue what today is. She says, today is the exact anniversary of him doing his first auction. And, you know, you get that Twilight Zone sense. The hair stands up on the back of your neck and going, whoa, you know, I buy this stuff at an auction, you know, and I, I don't do anything until the exact anniversary, 135 years ago, he was actually auctioning off his sack of flour in Austin, Nevada, when I'm reading this to her at the same time. You know, spooky stuff. Um, so I talked to her, and they celebrate Gridley Days in Austin every Father's Day weekend, and it's in honor of uh, Ruhl Colt Gridley. And uh, Ruhl Colt was a grocer, and in Austin, Nevada, they've actually restored his grocery store now, and it's a, it's a historical site. But he was a grocer, but he was a Democrat, and he was a, a copperhead, a Southern supporter during the Civil War. And in 64, him and Dr. Herrick, who was a Republican, and had his office on the other end of town, about a mile and a quarter away, uh, came to odds about who was going to be elected mayor in Austin. And they decided they were going to have a bet. And the loser, if Gridley lost, he had to carry a 50-pound sack of flour from his grocery store through town and deliver it to Dr. Herrick on the other end of town at his office. Well, the election was held and Gridley lost. And a lot of the townspeople knew that these two had been at odds, and they, they knew that these two here had had a bet. So on the day that they were going to collect the bet, a lot of them came and got outside of Gridley's store, including Dr. Herrick. And Gridley at first thought that this was really the, the feds pushing themselves upon him uh, just because he was a Southern supporter. And, but in good spirit, basically, he got the bag of flour and got it out. And, and the people basically dressed up this bag of flour with banners, stars, and bars, you know, supporting the Union flavor of this, of this event. And then they brought out the bar brass band. Uh, so the brass band and all the people basically started following Gridley through town as he carried this sack of flour. Dr. Herrick basically carried his cane and his coat for him as Gridley put the bag on his shoulder, had all the streamers and everything like that, and the brass, brands, brass band struck up John Brown's body. Uh, if anybody knows the story about John Brown's body, uh, it's to celebrate uh, a hero of the North uh, that uh, struck up a chord against slavery in the South, and uh, they wrote this song, John Brown's Body. Well, at the beginning of the Civil War, the Union soldiers were marching into battle and off to battle at this tune of John Brown's body, heralding uh, uh, John Brown as uh, a, a hero for the North. But they didn't know that the Southern supporters were actually singing John Brown's body as sort of an in-your-face type thing, because we hung him. You know, we killed the traitor. So they basically... Uh, Julia Ward Howe heard the soldier singing this and someone told her, called her into the, the office and said, listen, you need to find some better words for this. So she wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So they technically were singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic as a copperhead southern supporter carried a bag of flour through town to pay off a bet that he'd lost. Um, they had a little girl, six-year-old, called Emma Wixon. Emma had just moved into town because her mother had died and her father was, was a doctor and had moved to town, to Austin, Nevada. But everybody recognized her voice in church because she sang so well. So they had her with the brass band singing. Well, as it turned out, a little bit get ahead of myself here, but Emma Wixon turned out to be Emma Wixon, Nevada, the famous opera singer that eventually sang for the coronation of, of King George V. Uh, Queen Victoria basically gave her a $100,000 necklace because she was so good and really liked her so much. But here's this little six-year-old girl in Austin, Nevada, all because of this event for Rule Gridley. 
rule, they go through town and everybody's sort of drinking and it's a big celebration and everything like that and they get to the doctor's office and then there's the bar right next door. Uh, so everybody's drinking and, and the doc's Herrick says, he says, well thank you, you know, you paid your bet, but what am I going to do with a 50 pound sack of flour? Well, Mr. Gridley says, tell you what, there's a sanitary commission that's helping wounded soldiers on both sides of the line. It doesn't matter what, if you wear gray or blue, sanitary commission out of uh, uh, St. Louis is helping soldiers. So let's auction it off and the proceeds will go to the sanitary commission. Well, a little ahead of myself also, the Sanitary Commission is the forerunner of the American Red Cross. Um, so they got together and they got an auctioneer and everything like that, told the townspeople and everything, everybody's there and everybody, they put the bag of flour up for auction. And the bids come in, you know, $100 and everything like this, and, but it's in gold and silver because this is a mining era out there and people are actually got gold and silver in hand. Uh, so the wagers come in and the bag of flour sells and the guy says, well, Here's my money. Here's the bag of flour back. Sell it again. It's a good cause. I donate it back. Well, they kept this idea of reselling and reselling the bag of flour until no one else had any money or no one else wanted to bid on it. So Gridley bid it back because he's a grocer. He can use it. Well, they got together and they figured out that they had close to $3,000 that they had gained on this bag of flour that they were going to telegraph to, to St. Louis. Well, when they sent the Telegraph in Virginia City, there was a newspaper editor there that just happened to catch the Telegraph as it went through and was reading it and everything like this and said, send back to Austin this message. Mr. Gridley, you bring that sack of flour here to Virginia City. We'll show you how to do an auction. Gridley took up the challenge. They put all the banners and everything like that on the wagon and they, they went off to Virginia City. Gridley himself travels up and down the, the uh, mountainous uh, territory in Nevada doing this auction over and over again at the little mining gr group and he finally travels to California too and I've got where they've actually did a, a sack of flour auction at the Great Opera House in San Francisco. Gridley then puts the sack of flour on a ship, sails down to the Isthmus of Panama, puts it on a wagon, travels overland across the Isthmus of Panama, puts it on a steamship, and then travels up to the east coast of the states, where he then does his auction and crisscrosses different states across the north, all the way back to St. Louis, where uh, all told, his donations to the Sanitary Commission on this sack of flour were over $275,000 in 1864. Uh, did a little math, did a little checking, and it's about $3.9 million in this day and age. And he didn't spend any money, any of his own money on this, uh, or excuse me, he, he did only spent his own money on this. Uh, he didn't use any of the money he used, raised from the auction to do this. So, I mean, he was traveling on his own dime. Um, at uh, St. Louis, he traveled back to his store, which was not doing well because he hadn't been there to run it. Uh, his family had missed him sorely. Uh, especially according to some of the writings of his, his wife to her sister in Wisconsin that are contained in these letters. Um, and uh, he soon after that, because of his health, it was deteriorating, moved to California, and he died five years later in 1870.